University Libraries, Mr. Dave Cassens, and the faculty and staff of the University Libraries, I want to welcome you all to this afternoon's presentation on the 1949 St. Louis Exorcism and the Alexian Brothers. And before I go any further, I want to thank uh, several members of the, of the library staff, in particular, Erica Lauriello, Martha Allen, Keegan Phillips, uh, Tony Asbury, and others, and Sam uh, and Haroon for helping set up all of this. Uh, as you see, we're a very high budget operation. I'm giving the talk and filling up the food bowls over there. So in any case, thank you all very much. My name is Mr. John Wade. I'm University Archivist Emeritus for St. Louis University, and I'm currently working as the outreach coordinator for Pius XII Library, and I shall be the master of ceremonies. He's going to check something here. Uh, in any case, let's see if we can get this technology to work here. All right, there we go. Uh, the critical role which the Alexan brothers played in the care of the young man believed to be suffering for demonic possession in this 1949 exorcism event has been overlooked, basically, by, by, uh, by most people. It's never been very carefully researched. Remember that the most significant, there's I got the old hospital up there for you guys there. Uh, remember that the, uh, the most significant activities of exorcism, including the final expulsion of the demon from the young man, took place at various places uh, here in the St. Louis area, including at a relative's home in Belnor, Missouri, the campus of St. Louis University, the finest Catholic university in the country, I get paid to say, I get paid to say that, uh, and at the Alexian Brothers Hospital in South St. Louis. And I hope that this afternoon's uh, discussion contributes something to a greater appreciation of the actions of the Alexian Brothers in this incredible story, which continues to capture the interest of a lot of people uh, 70 years later. Um, I'm going to lay out for you today, kind of the right now, the, 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 the plans. Uh, we'll have three speakers, myself, Brother Warren Longo, a, a current uh, Alexian brother, and Mr. Pat Rick, a former Alexian brother who is researching and writing a book on the Alexian brothers and the 1949 exorcism. Uh, unfortunately for you all, I'm going to speak first, and I'll provide you with a little bit of the background to the story and describe the, the, the principal characters and then a brief outline of the events, uh, beginning at the young boy's home in Maryland in a suburb of the District of Columbia, all the way to the final events here in St. Louis at, at the hospital. I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail about certainly the last events or a lot of the, uh, the events of the exorcism, because I'll leave that to, to Brother and to, and to Pat. And after everybody's finished their remarks, we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, from the audience. And I'll introduce Brother Warren and Pat when, they, when, they, when it's their turn to speak. All right. Uh, in December 1973, Warner Brothers released the horror movie called The Exorcist. How many of you have seen The Exorcist? Uh, that's, that's good. Now, uh, the, the, the film was based on a novel of the same name written by William Peter Blatty and published in 1971. Now, how many of you read the book? Well, that's pretty good because most people, if they've seen the movie, they haven't read, had read the book. In any case, the movie, uh, directed by William Friedkin, earned 10 <laughs> Academy Awards, won two and became one of the highest grossing films of all time, and grossing in terms of money, not in terms of vomit and all, and all, all those, those other things. The movie featured Ellen Burstyn, Max Van Sydow, Jason Miller, and Linda Blair. The movie and the book tell the story of an actress, uh, Chris McNeil, played by Burstyn, and her 12-year-old daughter, Reagan, uh, played by Linda Blair, who are living in Georgetown area of Washington, D.C., while they're, while they're filming this, this, this movie. Um, young Reagan begins to exhibit these odd signs uh, of, of, of strange, strange behavior uh, when she, after she's playing with a Ouija board uh, in the home in which she's living, and it's determined that Reagan is possessed by a demonic spirit. And there's, see that right there. Okay. Uh, two Jesuit priests from Georgetown University are called in to perform an exorcism, uh, the rite of exorcism on the young girl. During the rite of exorcism, Father Lancaster Marin, the older priest there, uh, prayed by, played by Max von Sydow, he dies of a heart attack, uh, leaving his younger colleague, uh, Father Karras, uh, played by, uh, by Miller, to, to banish the demon. If you remember in the movie, the, the demon, or the demon, uh, Father Karras uh, talks to the demon and says, you know, you, you know, come into me, and then he jumps out the window, uh, and the, the demon takes possession of him, and the demon is released. Uh, and sort of the end of the story. 
Although millions of people have read the book or seen the movie, uh, relatively few people are aware that the events of the possession and the exorcism took place, uh, they were based on a series of real life events which took place here in St. Louis in 1940, or at least uh, many of them took place here in St. Louis. They, between January the 15th and Monday, April the 18th of 1949, uh, a young man whom I'll just call Robbie uh, was from a Maryland suburb of, of D.C. He's the, 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 the subject of the, uh, of the, uh, of the exorcism. Uh, from January through March the 5th, these events occurred in or near his home in, in, in the Washington area, while uh, from March the 6th through April the 18th, most of them took place here in St. Louis. The most critical location for the exorcism events in St. Louis uh, include the home of his aunt and uncle in Belle Nor. Uh, the, uh, the, it's across Natural Bridge Boulevard from the University of Missouri. The rectory of St. Francis Xavier College Church around the corner here. And as one of my colleagues always points out, that building has been torn down. Well, it has been torn down, but not because of, of any, anything regarding this. And also, finally, at the Alexian Brothers Hospital on South Broadway in St. Louis. I cannot answer for you definitively, you know, the cause of the boy's, the boy's problems. Was he possessed? Was he, was he psychologically, physically uh, uh, suffering from some sort of malady? Or was he making it up? And I've read evidence from reliable sources that would answer yes to, to all of them. Um, so in any case, who were, who were the, main, the main characters in, in this story? Principal character is a young man, and, and I'm just going to call him Robbie. Uh, and at the time of these unusual events, started in January of 49, he was 13 years old and was living in a Maryland suburb of, of the district. The other major character was Father Bill Bowdern, who was 52 years old at the time of the, of the events, and he was pastor of St. Francis Xavier College Church, uh, just, ar just around the corner from here. Uh, Father Bowdern had been the principal of St. Louis U High here in St. Louis, uh, the president of Campion Jesuit High School in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, and he was a chaplain in the Army during World War II. So Father Bowdern uh, was was the right person for this for this uh, for this task. Um, the other uh, his primary assistant for this uh, the exorcism was Father Ray Bishop, who taught here at St. Louis University in the Department of Education, and we'll talk a little bit more about him about him later. Uh, it was Father Bishop who kept a case study or a diary of the events of the exorcism, and I know Brother Warren is going to, is going to talk a little bit more about about that later. Uh, Bishop and I'm sorry, Bowdern and uh, Bishop were assisted by numerous other Jesuits. Uh, I know one of you remembers Father Walt Halloran. Uh, he was a, a seminarian here at the time. Later on, became Father Halloran. Uh, he had been a student at Campion Jesuit High School, and he knew Father Bowdern. Uh, Father Bowdern there. Uh, in any case, he would come back. He actually was a, a chaplain in the army during Vietnam, uh, and there were several other Jesuits who assisted on this, and, and if you're curious about that, maybe we can talk about, about them later. How the story gets out into the public, I mean, remember this is 1949, there was no Twitter, internet, uh, Facebook, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's it's kind of interesting. After the, after the final events of the exorcism, Robbie, it was, I guess it was about two weeks afterwards, uh, brother, did he stay, for, how long did he stay here in St. Louis after the, was it about two weeks is what I, what I understood. Well, he, he told, he, he got home and he, he wrote Father Bowder and said that he was, uh, he was doing, doing okay and that, uh, you know, he was grateful for, for what the, the priests and, and the brothers had done for him. Uh, in the summer, though, of 1949, <laughs> Uh, let me kind of back up. During, when he was in Maryland, he did see uh, uh, Robbie's family took him to see a Lutheran minister, this Reverend Luther Miles Schultz, uh, and Reverend Schultz had an interest in the paranormal, in the uh, I don't want to say occult, but certainly in, in the paranormal, and and so this Reverend Schultz was attending a conference of of, of, uh, of paranormal. Uh, psych, you know, just say a parapsychologist para that summer, and he indicated at that conference that he had witnessed what he called poltergeist phenomena uh, at, at a young boy's home. And he did say that this young boy was taken to a city in the Midwest, and he didn't mention the name of the city, uh, but in any case, he, 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 he said that he was taken to the Midwest. Well, the reports of Schultz's remarks, even you know, even 70 years ago, and that's—I didn't point that out at the beginning. This is the 70th anniversary, 
2019 of the, of the events of the exorcism, these, the, uh, this report by Schultz to this parapsychologist made its way into several newspapers, including uh, the fake Washington, fake news Washington Post. I guess a political commentary there. I probably, probably shouldn't, have, shouldn't have throw that in. But anyway, it was in the, in the Washington Post. Uh, and one of the readers of the Washington Post article happened to be an undergraduate English major at Georgetown University by the name of William Peter Blatty. Okay, and here's, here's a picture of, of Blatty. Who, who is he? Now, he, he just passed away, I guess, about a, y a year and a half ago, not, not that long ago. Uh, Blatty would use this article as the basis for his novel, The Exorcist, which appeared in 1971. Uh, and we already talked about how in the novel it's a young girl associated with Georgetown, when in reality uh, it was a young boy here in, in, in St. Louis. Well, what I'm going to do now is just kind of, I mean, I've got a lot of uh, detailed information, but I'm, I'm going to kind of, kind of gloss through that. This is a picture of Robbie's home uh, in, in Maryland, at least a modern day uh, picture. And, and it was early in, uh, in, on a Saturday evening in January 15th of 1949. Robbie and his and his grandmother, his, his mother on his, uh, I mean his grandmother on his mother's side, began reporting hearing these strange noises in the house, scratching noises and all that. And they they thought it might be you know a, a mouse, a rat, a squirrel had gotten in. Um, uh, and and uh, then they thought they saw a picture of, of, of Christ on the wall there, shaking in 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 the in the in the, uh, in the room. Uh, eventually, the noises stopped. They even called in exterminators uh, to to try to to see if they uh, you would have thought they would have called in Ghostbusters, but they didn't they didn't call them. I guess they I guess they weren't around then. Anyway. Several more evenings, the, the noises uh, would uh, continued, and they usually started in the early evening, about seven o'clock, and typically they ended around 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 midnight. In January, though, 26 of that year, uh, Robbie's aunt uh, Matilda, Aunt Tilly, uh, who happened to live here live here in Maryland, in Maryland Heights, in in Richmond Heights, um, uh, passed away. Aunt Tilly, I mean, there's various reports about Aunt Tilly's connection. Uh, I mean, obviously she was Robbie's aunt. Good. Uh, yeah. Some say that Aunt Tilly introduced Robbie to the Ouija board. Others say no, that it was his mother and his grandmother that introduced Robbie to the, to the Ouija board. In any case, uh, af at the time, uh, at the time of, of uh, when a after Aunt Tilly uh, passed away, Robbie did get out the Ouija board and tried to contact the spirit of his, of his deceased aunt. Well, strange things happened to Robbie at school. You know, the you know his desk started moving around at home. You know, things flew off the off the uh, off of tables. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, there was a Catholic priest was was evidently called in uh, to visit him. They brought holy water in. The holy water bottles flew across the room. All these sorts of things. Uh, they, there was reports of the bed bed levitating. And so and people ask me, well, did things in the movie? Happened as they did. Well, not exactly, but similar similar things did happen with uh, shaking and, and, and things and things moving uh, moving around. And they did notice. Oh, here's the Ouija board. I kind of got ahead of myself. If any of you have Ouija boards, I'd get rid of them if I were you. Uh, uh, here's here's the home in in Belnor, and I apologize. I shouldn't I shouldn't be so flippant about it. But here's the home of his of the aunt and uncle here in Belnor. Scratches appeared on his body, and it, and uh, you know, you know, and and at one point, they thought that the word Lewis appeared in scratches on his body, which indicated to the family that that must mean Saint Louis. And so they took, and Robbie had family here, in addition to, to Aunt Tilly, to uh, other relatives here, and so he, they took him to his aunt and uncle's house in Bel Nor, uh, and that's a picture of, of, of the house out in out in out in, in Bel Nor. Uh, <coughs> And so by March the 6th, 1949, Robbie and his mother were, were here. Uh, the, March the 9th, here's a picture of St. Louis U uh, back in the late, late 40s. I wasn't here then, believe it or not. Uh, it was Robbie's cousin. Um, it was in his, uh, her mom and dad's house that he was staying in Belnor. She was a student here at St. Louis University. And she mentioned to one of her teachers uh, Father Ray Bishop, uh, these strange things were happening to her cousin at her house. 
And so uh, Father Bishop goes out to the house, and I won't go on all the details, but Father Bishop goes out to the house, and the odd things continue to happen there. Uh, they come back to the university. They talk with the president, with Father Reinhardt, who then suggested that they, they, they uh, uh, ask Father Bill Bowdern to, to go out to the house. Uh, so, you know, Bowdern, Bowdern did that. And um, he first came to the house on March the 11th. And, and I want to emphasize, between March the 11th and it was April the 18th, I guess was the final events, these guys, and the election brothers too, you know, eventually, they went out to that house, uh, or they, they, they took care of him in a hospital, almost every day, and these guys had no idea what they were getting themselves into each day uh, they, they went out there. Um, so, you know, this, this uh, you know, the, the scratches continued to appear. Uh, some were bizarre. They, they thought the, uh, uh, a picture of the devil appeared on Robbie on one occasion. The word hell showed up across his chest. Other manifestations occurred, the boy urinating, passing gas, speaking in foreign tongues, foreign languages, cursing at the, at the priest. And beginning on Monday, March 21st, and for the next several weeks, he came, went back and forth between the, the uh, college church here, rectory and the university, and, and, and the Alexa Brothers Hospital. Uh, the actions of the exorcism uh, continued uh, and reached their climax on Easter weekend in April 1949. Uh, and here's a picture of the rite of exorcism. And, and, I, and I should point out that the rite of exorcism in the Catholic Church, it's not, uh, it's not uh, you know, well, uh, mom and dad come to father and say, hey, little Johnny's acting kind of strange. Let's do an exorcism. I mean, there's a whole series of, of, uh, of tests and procedures that have to be gone through. And the rite of exorcism itself was, was not, again, not just one or two prayers. It was very lengthy. So they, they kept repeating these these prayers over and over again. And I want to get up here too. So the, the final events of the exorcism reached their climax on Easter weekend in April 1949 when Robbie was under the care of the Alexan brothers at their hospital in South St. Louis. And I have an, a, an awful lot more I could say, but I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time uh, on, 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 on me, but I want uh, to turn it over at this point to our next speaker, uh, Brother Warren Longo. I'll say this, Brother Warren, is an Alexian brother. He's been a member of the Alexian brothers for over 60 years, and you knew some of the men who were involved in the in the exorcism. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you all hear me? Um, first of all, I have some preliminary remarks before I turn this over to uh, Patrick Rick. And uh, first of all, who am I? <laughs> uh, uh, as, as was mentioned, I've been in the Alexian Brothers for 62 years. And um, in fact, I had my uh, uh, jubilee, my 60th jubilee at Pius V Church here in St. Louis. And the reason why I had it there was because of the fact that I had my 50th there. And also, this is so interesting, because you're going to hear throughout uh, my little talk here that Our Lady of Fatima, who was very a, a very prominent figure in, uh, yeah, there, there she is, Our Lady of Fatima. That's the statue. I'll go into that in a little while. But anyway, it was... Uh, uh, on the f I wanted to have my 50th, 60th jubilee there at Pius V, okay? <laughs> and the secretary said, brother, we don't have any available uh, weekends for, your, uh, for a Saturday for your jubilee because I had used them for my 50th and the choir knew me and all the rest of it. But she said, uh, well, let me check again. She said, you know what? The only available Time that we have is Saturday morning, which was the feast of, and it was uh, the 13th of May, which was the feast of our uh, Lady of, uh, uh, over there, our, our Lady of Fatima. <laughs> and I, that, in fact, it was written up in the St. Louis Review that our Lady of Fatima played a very important role, not only in my life, because that was the 100th anniversary of our Lady of Fatima was on the very day that I renewed my vows and for uh, 60 years. And so we'll get into that in just a few minutes. But anyway, 
Uh, I don't know if you know it or not. We're older than the Jesuits. <laughs> Any Jesuits out there? We're older than the Jesuits. We go back 800 years during the bubonic plague in 1348 to 1351 when priests fled the towns, when government officials fled the towns, the Alexian brothers, which was around the Rhine there in Germany, we stayed behind. We nursed those who were affected by the bubonic plague. Some of the brothers lost their own lives, but we stayed around and we became, by the way, after we did that, the official city pallbearers because we buried the dead. And that is something that, by the way, I feel a privilege when I am helping burying the dead because uh, that's such a great tradition with the Alexian brothers. Uh, so there's no one founder. You know, say, who founded you? We don't have a founder. God founded us. <laughs> and uh, another thing is our charism and our spirit. We care for the most unwanted. Can you imagine Brother Cornelius, when no other hospital would accept him, said, yes, bring the boy over. And Father Bodur knew that, that he don't have to go churching other hospitals. Brother Cornelius, the rector, the administrator said, send him over without any hesitation. Oh, I wonder if we should take this. You know. No, uh-uh, because he was the most unwanted. I want to tell you a story. Any, and anybody know, because this means a lot to me, it, it has changed my life to some extent. Do any of you know, not Doris Day, but Dorothy Day? Yeah. Have you heard of Dorothy Day? She's a suffragist movement, founder of the Catholic Worker. Karen House is here in St. Louis. I met, uh, Dorothy, I met uh, uh, Dorothy Day in 1972 <clears throat> with the Taizé community, hosted her. And there was a big reception for her. And when I walked in, uh, Brother Frank of Taze said to Dorothy, Dorothy, people were talking, you know, and, 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 and she said, uh, Dorothy, this is Brother Warren. He's an Alexian brother. She looked, she was sitting in a chair. She looked at me. She stood up. Alexian brothers, you Alexian brothers. Her gray blue eyes pierced, literally pierced my soul. I tear up every time I think of it. You Alexian brothers, when nobody would take my men, meaning those that were drunks on the streets, you took them in your, you took them in your place. God bless you. Don't ever forget the poor. I have not forgotten the poor. I work with the poor all the time. But anyway, so that, that, that's it. Uh, I, I want to put this into a larger context, too, and that is this, as was mentioned, is the 70th anniversary of the exorcism, 1949. That's uh, 2019. However, it is also the 150th anniversary of Brother Thalen, Brother Bonaventure Thalen, coming to St. Louis to establish a hospital. And guess what he did? Because he had... We in, the, uh, in the, uh, Germany, all of we had a lot of psychiatric hospitals. So what he did was he bought the Simons Mansion, which, by the way, was right near the Mississippi. You could see the Mississippi from there. It reminded him of the Rhine and of the homeland. And what he did was, after he bought that, he built the first hospital. He built a little hospital there, and then and then he built another one there, a bigger one. And he added, besides medical care, he added a psychiatric section to it. And that is why our, 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 we are, that's why he was uh, sent to Alexian Brothers because our hospital, uh, even at, uh, during 1949, had a section which was the psychiatric section, the fifth floor, which he was on the fifth floor. He was put on the fifth floor. Um, I also want to... Uh, uh, um, yeah, I want to say something else too, and that is that uh, one of our brothers was the who was the last brother. He died in 19, 2014, Brother John Greider. He was the last brother to have witnessed very peculiar things that happened during the time that he, as a nurse, was taking care of Robbie. We call him Robbie. 
And he said on his deathbed, Brother Warren, please do something. Everybody they think of the exorcist, they think of the Jesuits, which is great. But they don't think of the Alexian brothers. We're always in the background. He said, what we did, what all the brothers did, and he named them, and I knew them, and they're all dead now, but I knew them and what they did day and night over and over. And what this boy did to the Alexian brothers, I will go into that in just a minute. Um, so anyway, uh, they, they uh, and the, the strange phenomenon that Brother John Grider explained to me was, and he was right there. He said, oh my God, the strange things that happen. And he went into some details about that. Uh, incidentally, I used the name Robbie. That is not his real name, uh, but that's what we call him. And uh, Robbie was placed in our hospital, Alexian Brothers Hospital, on South Broadway, the old hospital, March 21st, 1949, for a short time. Uh, Pat Rick, the author of a new book, which is coming out shortly, will explain the events that took place in Maryland and Mount Rainer before Robbie and his family came to St. Louis, and that was also explained by, by very, very well. And in 1966, by the way, I took the place of Brother Cornelius. He was the administrator of the hospital and the superior of the hospital. I took his place as a director of education for our brothers in Chicago. Well, he got sick, and then he, he died, and they asked me to take his place. So one day after I took his place, it was about six months after that, I said, you know, I need to clean out the drawers. Did you ever get into it? So I took, well, I cleaned out the drawer, and in one of the drawers was this. This is the case study of the Alex, of, of, of uh, this phenomenon that happened. And uh, what you can see, it's been redacted. Redactus, redaction is a very big word now. Did you <laughs> notice that? Yeah. It's been redacted, pu uh, uh, putting out in uh, black ink the area so that we would never, ever, ever. And by the way, I spoke to Bishop, Archbishop Carlson. I spoke to, uh, Reverend, uh, to the Auxiliary Bishop Rivetuso. And they all know that I've been giving talks, and they say, we, Brother Warren, we respect the Alexian brothers because never, ever did you, uh, this confidentiality, never did you compromise that whatsoever. You're free to talk about it. You're free to write about it because we know that you'll never divulge the person's real name, even though I have, I know the person's real name. Okay. And then, um, uh, in 1971, of course, the book, the movie by Blatty came out, and it was a phenomenon. I remember it very well. I was at Loyola University in Chicago, and I gave a talk about it along with uh, several, along with a psychiatrist, uh, it was a theologian, and somebody else. And I tell you, there was no room in the auditorium because it was packed, completely packed. People were sitting on the stairs uh, because they were so interested in this phenomenon that happened. It was the most powerful movie uh, ever made, and I want to have some closing remarks. Um, uh, the, the, for, for example, um, what has come out, I don't know if you, but this is a DVD, In the Grip of Evil. Now, and it's based on the book by possessed by Thomas Allen. I tell you, I saw this. It was, it was a documentary. I think th this is a Discovery Channel or one of those channels, documentary channels, had this, and this is fairly accurate. It's pretty accurate. Uh huh. And uh, this book, in fact, Thomas Allen tried to contact me when he was in St. Louis, but I didn't want to get involved, so I didn't respond to 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 him interviewing me, because at that time I just, uh, it was about 20 years ago, I just didn't want to do it. So anyway, uh, and you can get these on by Amazon, or you can get it, it's called Possessed by Thomas Allen, and In the Grip of Evil uh, is a, a, a DVD about, about uh, very much about what's in the book. Okay, and, um, oh yes, and, by the way, Father Flaherty, 
It was a good friend of the brothers, and he, at our uh, 100th, 100th Jubilee, did a book about the Alexian brothers in St. Louis. This is the book, and it's called To Rest in Charity. And there is a whole chapter on the Alexians and the exorcism, and there is a picture of Father Boder in there. I have uh, three extra books here. And whoever wants to take one, you're very welcome to. I'm sorry, there's two extra books. <laughs> yeah. The name of the book? Yeah. It's uh, ch Charity, yeah, To Rest, to, to rest, rest in Charity. Charity. Yeah. And there's, there's two extra ones here. I'll just put them over here for the time being. And... Uh, Another thing I would like to, to say is that, uh, uh, oh, I think this is important because it says again that the brothers, I'm very proud of the brothers, of what we've done for 800 years, took care of those that nobody else would take care of. Remember it was called the plague of the 80s? What was the plague of the 80s? AIDS. Guess who was the first group that opened up a place for people with AIDS, the Alexian brothers. And we got a lot of people and big authority in uh, Washington, D.C. that were opposed to it because it was in their neighborhood, not in my neighborhood. Well, Archcardinal Bernardin made sure that he gave us the house and the property. It was a, uh, it was a former convent in Chicago to open it up. And it's still open by Brother Bonaventure House. I'm proud of that because you know what? I saw it for myself. Some of the parents would have their son or daughter, or particularly their son, in the car. And they said, get out of here now and go live over there. They were kicked, literally kicked out of their home because of the HIV. But the brothers took them in when nobody else would do it. Um, uh, so I think uh, that's about it for my preliminary remarks. Let me see, anything else? Um, oh, I also want to, uh, when, the, the, when this was completed and the uh, exorcism was successful, this was April 29th, 1949, this was received by Brother Cornelius, the manager or the administrator of the hospital and the superior of the community. And let me read it to you. This was sent to him by, by Father Raymond Bishop. The enclosed report, dear Brother Cornelius, the enclosed report is a summary of the case which you have known for the past several weeks. The brother's part in this case has been so very important that I thought you should have the case history which is the one I just showed you. This is the case history for your permanent files. One of the finest benefits that has come to me as a result of this case is the high appreciation of the work and religious devotion of the Alexian brothers. The prayerful assistance of your community was certainly a strong factor in winning the battle against Satan. Your own cooperation to the extent of establishing public devotion to Our Lady of Fatima will always be associated with the inspirational aspects of the case. The, cross it up, family has been won over completely by the wholehearted charity of your brothers. There is little doubt that the intention of Mrs., his mother, to become Catholic has been deeply influenced by the Christ-like attitude of the brothers who worked with him. It will always be a distinct privilege for me to remember you and your community at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So, uh, um, by the way, uh, when he, um, uh, he doesn't remember anything, but uh, this is the rosary that I say every single day. And uh, the rosary is set around the clock by the brothers caring for Robbie. Uh, the statue was the first floor in the main lobby. Oh, sorry. And, and we've already said, yeah. And uh, it was on the first floor. And Brother got it 
because of the great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, but he put it in the lobby. And it's still at St. Alexis Hospital. It really belongs to us, but we're keeping it there for the time being. But what we did is when Holy Week occurred in 1949, Brother had the statue brought up to the fifth floor, the psychiatric division, not in his room, but in the hallway next to his room. And that is uh, because of the great devotion. And the brothers played the rosary, prayed the rosary day and night over and over again. And the Monday, uh, Brother Cornelius brought it to the fifth floor outside Robbie's room during the Holy Week of 1949. The Monday after Easter, the rite of exorcism was a success. On August the 20th, 1949, well, that was what the Washington Post said. But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll turn that over now. And by the way, another thing, I don't know if there's, I think there, but one of the things that we have in our archives in Chicago is the statue, which is a small statue, it's not a big one like Mary, it's about like that, was placed on the bedside of Brother Cornelius, put this on the bedside of Robbie, which is St. Michael the Archangel. St. Michael, wow. And incidentally, when he left, everything came, uh, was turned out well. What he did when he got married in 1970, he named his first son Michael. Before I introduce our third, oh, sorry. Before I introduce our third speaker, I should point out that when R Robbie converted to Catholicism, his family, and uh, he went to a Jesuit high school. So let's let's let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's don't let's don't forget don't let's don't forget that. Okay, um, I did not go to a Jesuit high school. I went to Alton Marquette Catholic High School. I have some of my classmates here. Uh, anyway. Uh, our third speaker, if, if our third speaker looks familiar to you, it is because he has portrayed President Bill Clinton in film and on television. That makes him the counterfeit Bill. <laughs> that, was, that was his joke, not, not mine. Anyway, our, our, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Mr. J. Patrick Rick to you. Uh, Pat is an author, a film producer, uh, an actor, as we just mentioned, and he's also, as Brother Warren mentioned, he's also done re a former Alexian brother, and he's also currently doing research on the Alexian brothers and the, the 1949 exorcism. And I'll turn it over to, to Pat, and then after that we'll have time for, for questions. Thank you. Pat? Truth is stranger than fiction so far, right? Yeah. Years ago when I wrote The Abbey and Me with the subtitle Renegades, Rednecks in Real Estate and Religion, uh, that book is a snapshot in time. The Alexian brothers were here in America. Uh, it is a true story centered around a village known as Gresham in central Wisconsin. In 1975, shortly after midnight, on that faithful New Year's morning, a band of Menominee warriors from a nearby reservation captured a monastic-like complex known as the Novitiate. It was a place in the piney woods of Wisconsin where novice men trained to be Alexian brothers. During my research for that earlier book, I kept running into a story of a different time and in a different place. Many of the characters were the same, but most, if not all, are now dead. I and I'll explain that later. Forgive me for taking you on this circuitous route. In The Abbey and Me, I go into detail about the 1975 early winter episode in deep, deep snowy Wisconsin, having captured that freezing remote novitiate. Native American dissidents demanded that the Alexians give them that vacant place known as the novitiate. Not surprising, the Alexians insisted that the Menominee warriors free hostages captured in that hostile takeover before negotiations could ever begin. 
These were not the days of the Wild West where Indians circled covered wagons of pioneers. You heard me correctly, this was 1975. It was a time and a place where neighbors, sheriffs, FBI, ATF, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Wisconsin National Guard circled the Indians instead. Sporadically, they shot at each other, but it ended peacefully. Following that month-long siege, the novitiate was never the same again. Currently, my newest journey is an odd twist on an older story in many different ways by other filmmakers and documentarians. I bring you a very different version. I'm offering you a peek into the latest nonfiction literary effort. Uh, it is one of those stories behind the story, a backstory, if you will. Don't expect me to, uh, or don't you expect to hear about details about copious amounts of projectile vomiting, resembling pre pre uh, split, uh, green pea soup. My work in progress is entitled That Purloined Diary, an unsettling case study of an exorcism. So far, it has been a bizarre treasure hunt. Uh, it began when a person tracked me down and got my mail, uh, email address two years ago. He eventually, we both eventually spoke by phone about the history of the novitiate, the hostile takeover, and last but not least, or least but not last, the 1949 exorcism. This faceless voice on the phone told me it had documents I might be interested in seeing. In particular, this character caught my attention when asked if I would like to have them. I thought to myself, hell yes. I discouraged the caller from sending such a treasure trove through the US Postal Service. Instead, I suggested these documents should be professionally copied and then sent to me like using uh, FedEx or something similar. I did receive those many documents, that old true story of a young man and his struggle to escape a dreadful situation. In fact, the contents included correspondence between the major players in this famous St. Louis uh, exorcism. The package also included the long sought after case study, also known as the diary. So I'm going to read to you my preface to that upcoming book. The author, William Peter Blatty, wrote The Exorcist in 1971. Then the movie followed in 73, both on paper and especially in film, directed by William Friedkin. It startled and scared the hell out of millions. I sat in a Dallas, Texas movie theater with shivers running up and down my spine. It was altogether, though, different reasons that I was having shivers up my spine. I was uh, disturbed more than other frightened movie par uh, uh, patrons. You see, I had privy to the or origin and background giving birth to this fictional story on the big screen. Who can forget the girl turning her head in 60 degrees? <laughs> in this book, not yet par uh, published, I'm offering you a different perspective. I shall never try to dissuade or debunk or recruit or convince believers or disbelievers, nor will I attempt to sell you on the idea of an exorcism and the practice of the right by the Roman Catholic Church. But first allow me to take you back in time. Three cars waited for them at a train station. Standing there, more than a dozen young men traveled together from Chicago earlier that July morning, 1966. Northbound, their train crossed over the Illinois border, passed through Milwaukee, skirted Green Bay, and ultimately disembarked at Shawano, Wisconsin. In less than an hour, they would arrive home, their new home, Gresham, Wisconsin, a rustic little village. Some were outwardly enthusiastic, others were quiet and perhaps unsure of the decision they had made. And the rest, who knows? Meeting them were three men in black, a Norbertine priest and two Alexian brothers dressed in clerical business suits and white clerical Roman collars, looking as if, as if made for Hollywood. Their journey delivered them to a monastic story-appearing institution. 
beside a roaring waterfall on the edge of a densely wooded area. Their destination was just a healthy walking distance from the nearby village. Breathtaking would not be an exaggerating adjective to describe their arrival. Greeting them were more men in black, wearing monastic garb as if they were also straight out of central casting. Enthusiastic young men, more their age, poured out of the grand entrance, overlooking the water, introducing themselves as brother this and brother that. They brought the new arrival's luggage in from that caravan of cars. Now the fresh recruits stood inside what was a once grand mansion given to the Alexian brothers by a lonely, wealthy woman. It was as if a movie crew could have selected this location to create a film. Authentic costumes, the sterile feeling of a clustered convent, and the realization they had committed to join the Alexians. The new men were to learn the Alexians traced their origins to the 12th century, among other curious things. Before I take you down this nonfiction rabbit hole, uh, it is only fair I reveal to you, I too was one of those pimple-faced new arrivals in 1966. It was at this remote location how we came to learn a once well-kept secret. After six months, our postulant class had dwindled down to only eight. Over the century, the, the Alexian brothers learned how to weed out individuals not fitting in or those wishing to leave on their own volition. Time had uh, come for us to move forward. We were novices that accepted the black habit of the Alexians. We now wore the basic uniform that came along with acceptance into the Alexian community. So I became an Alexian novice and given the religious name of Gordon. One day, we were sat down and told the basics of an astonishing story dating back to 1949. Brother Florian Eberle, our novice master, took it upon himself to divulge a bundle of unbelievable facts and observations. Florian was not just telling us a story handed down to him because he saw, he heard, he experienced firsthand an exorcism. When writing the earlier book, The Abbey and Me, only two pages did I dedicate to an extraordinary saga taking place in St. Louis, Missouri a hospital belonged to the Alexians. I only mentioned the story in my first book. Since then, I've learned so much more. This newer book, That Purloined Diary, you will read the details, recently discovered documents, and interviews with individuals playing vital, role, vital roles add to this account. The book is a true story having reared its head and demanding attention. After spanning many decades, the story just won't go away. Look at the people in here. It won't go away. So sit back, read, or listen to this real account. So now jumping forward about a half century in an early chapter of this book, I planned and launched an aggressive fact-finding road trip. Telephone conversations just wouldn't work. I wanted to go face to face with people who had at least secondhand information. Except for the boy himself, I know of no one who is still alive and in their right mind. Again, I read from the book. It wasn't until 7 p.m. that evening when did I pull into the residence of the Alexian brothers in St. Louis. Nearly 15 hours of drive time from Austin, Texas was over. Greeted by five Alexians, there were familiar faces, but only one dating back 50 years ago. It was Brother Jeffrey. Jeffrey's a Canadian and a year ahead of me when we were in Wisconsin. There was plenty of gray hair to go around, including my own. Jeffrey showed me my guest quarters at the residence on Ohio Avenue at the intersection of Keokuk. I lay in my bed thinking that when I was only one year old, a baby in Texas, something extraordinary had taken place here in 1949. It involved Jesuit priests, Alexian brothers, and a 13-year-old boy. 
My journey was to investigate the famous book and movie and separate fact from fiction, and it has been a daunting task. Too tired to sleep, I tinkered with the bedside radio clock until I stumbled upon George Nouri and his late night show, Coast to Coast AM. I recall being a guest on his show years earlier when my book, The Abbey and Me, was published. He tried on several occasions to get me to talk about that exorcism on air, but then I didn't know enough to make it interesting and informative. So I declined to go down that blind alley but agreed to get back with George Nouri when I had more to offer. Remembering I committed to join the brothers in their early morning prayers, I forced myself to sleep, knowing, only, knowing I only had a few hours to recharge my brain. Fifty-three years earlier, in that long-ago monastery, my wake-up call would have come at 4.50 a.m. when I was two in Alexian. Approaching six decades ago, our training and discipline began the second morning after we arrived at the monastery. Whether it was 10 minutes before 5 a.m. or 50 minutes after 4 a.m. made no difference. We were learning that hospitals provide services 24, hour, 24 hours a day and emergencies were a way of life. The discipline was part of our formation. Imagine Teenage boys routinely getting up and out of bed well before sunrise. Moving forward, I wrote this while developing my current book in progress, That Purloin Diary. At St. Louis, Auxiliary Bishop Rivituso was given a brief tour of the newer hospital built in the 70s. He acknowledged the statue of the Virgin Mary and the devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. The significance here was the role this five-foot statue played and represented during the 1949 exorcism that took place in the old hospital, the former hospital built in the 1870s. It once stood in the same location. The entourage followed the visiting bishop stepping out the front door of the hospital and only to be confronted by Christ the Healer. This 16 foot tall brass and fiberglass sculpture had been dedicated in 1984, part of the brothers 650th anniversary celebration. The brothers kitchen prepared a simple business lunch to chat with the bishop. During a lull and bites of our sandwiches, I leaned over and I introduced myself. I, I explained I was an Alexian novice there to learn more about the 1949 exorcism that took place on this property. The bishop quickly suggested I make an appointment to speak and visit with the most reverend Robert J. Herman, Auxiliary Bishop Emeritus with the, Arch, uh, the Archdiocese here. Like a hot potato, had I been handed off to someone not so approachable, I wondered. Tell him I told you to call, Rutuso said. I said no more. Perhaps I had been handed a gift. I considered emeritus meant someone who's been around for a while <laughs> and knew more than the rest of us. But it would also indicate Herman was among those prefer, uh, preferring to keep the rite of exorcism close to his chest and unwilling to discuss in 1949. Auxiliary Bishop Robert J. Herman came from a generation of St. Louis Catholic priests that were tight-lipped because they had been instructed to be so. I acquired an original signed letter explaining that had been strictly forbidden by the Archbishop of St. Louis, later a cardinal years ago. Archbishop Ritter asked us to not divulge at the time. That quote came from a letter written on May 4, 1972 by William S. Bowdern, Jesuit, <coughs> the Jesuit point man, archist, uh, archivist in uh, 1949. In part, this is why I wish to get to the bottom of this story. From the perspective of the Alexian brothers who assisted the Jesuits, I did not expect to get full disclosure from everyone, but I was going to give it my best try. After three St. Louis days and three nights in search of the facts, half-truths, secret hidden, secrets hidden away, 
My bags were packed to drive less than five hours to Downers Grove, Illinois, outside of Chicago. I drove past the old brewery, Gateway Arch, across the Mississippi, into the land of Lincoln. I was particularly interested in catching up with a friend, a former Alexian by the name of Ray. Ray worked with one of those senior brothers known as John Greider. He was an interesting character. Those two Alexian brothers were not fond of each other. If you think two religious men working in the healing arts and members of a pious profession get along, think again. Their personal chemistry clashed. Before he died of natural causes in advanced years, Greider appeared on my radar. Rumor had it he knew more than a little something about exorcism. The 1945 St. Louis exorcism, that is. So it may have been 20 years and I was doing the same thing as today. I had an appointment with, the, uh, uh, with an elderly Alexian. I eventually got around to question about exorcism. The brother was not very forthcoming. The interview came to a halt. Years later, he sat before a camera and recorded his life history. More recently, I requested to be allowed to view that video. My request was denied. I didn't consider that to be a dead end. I'm persistent, and I will try again. My drive north brought me back to a place where I became an Alexian novice in 1967, the novitiate at Gresham, Wisconsin. I had been invited to stop and speak. I'd come all this way from Austin, Texas for two reasons. One was to be a guest speaker for the Fox Valley Ghost Hunters of Wisconsin, and secondly, to interview a key person with knowledge of that exorcism case. I'm a bit embarrassed to admit I agreed to participate in that, organizers of the ghost hunting adventure. Uh, they were, we were to gather before midnight at this remote, monastic-like, crum uh, monastic -like, crumbling building that was once my home. It was my job to share the rich history there. Then the organizers would lead paying ticket holders on an adventure in search of ghosts and other paranormal activities. I wasn't afraid. Instead, I was amused. Playing a role in this Halloween-like charade, I also felt as if it was a little sacrilegious and over the top. Finally, the day come. I was to sit down and visit with the person who had participated in acquiring those alluring documents. I accepted, but reluctant to stay overnight. My host with the exorcism documents insisted I stay. Before I had even arrived, I was told by phone the accommodations were not much more than camping out. I hesitated. I hoped I was not setting myself up for a rendezvous with an axe murderer living in a tent or a trailer. There's more to follow. Thank you. I have an addendum. I have an addendum. Brother Warren has a short addendum, and then we'll open the floor for questions. And I'll bring the uh, microphone out to the audience. Two things. One of them, <laughs> you, uh, you heard about the book, The Abbey. Well, what happened was, this is Gresham, Wisconsin. This is winter. And uh, when the, uh, uh, there was the, the warrior society of the, who, came and uh, uh, took over uh, the building there. It was an empty building, but nonetheless, there was the caretaker that was there and his wife. Put a gun, uh, knocked on the door at 12 midnight, put a gun to the head of the guy and said, you call those brothers, we're taking this place over. So they called the brother and Brother Morris said, oh, 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 well, okay, well, come over, otherwise these people will be in trouble. And so Brother Morris came immediately and anyway, after 30 days in which there was no bloodshed because uh, we befriended the Indians, even though they took it over, you know, not appropriately. 
So anyway, one of the first things that after the, what, what the, the National Guard did, the Wisconsin National Guard, is that they were on the outside and the Indians were in the inside of the building playing basketball in the chapel and all kinds of other things. But anyway, so finally, uh, when we made this provision, we gave it away, we gave it to them for one dollar. And uh, so what happened was uh, we did, uh, during the, uh, the seizure, the uh, National Guard turned off the electricity. So there was 43 toilets, and there was frozen, you know what, in the toilets. The first thing Brother Morris said to me was, Brother Warren, here is a big barrel, here is a big scoop, take all the you know what out. So there I was, taking, scooping out all the you know what. <laughs> I'll never forget that. And uh, even though he's deceased now, he used to laugh about it so much. He said, boy, I did have you really do. The worst thing you could do was take all those toilets and take all the crap out of it. <laughs> yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to say about uh, the, the exorcism goes back 600 years with the Roman ritual, which is the rite of exorcism. They have actual prayers for that. Uh, what we see ultimately is the power of good over evil, which is a timely message for our world today. People asked me a question back in June at the hospital when I presented this, and I said, it shows good overcomes evil. After what? The crucifixion comes the resurrection. After the terrible evil of the crucifixion comes the resurrection. Um, I also wanted to, to that uh, um, there are some Jesuits who have researched the phenomenon and think there is not enough to believe that demonic possession happened. Perhaps it was multiple personalities. Frankly, it doesn't matter. If it is multiple personalities, that's fine with me. I don't think so, though, from what I know and what I read at the official case study. <laughs> there are Jesuits who knew Father Bodern who attest that Father Bodern is not the type that is led to believe that this was a staged thing. The Exorcist, by the way, was printed in 14 languages with the hardcover sales of 200,000. The film was the first horror film to be nominated for a Best Picture Academy Award. 14 different witnesses, 14, who saw the phenomenon that was happening with Robbie, all attested the same thing. Here are some, a few that uh, are not listed in uh, most places. The relic of a Saint Margaret Mary Alaka was pinned to the mattress. These are what the brothers told me who were there. They were right there, and they told me this. And they, uh, uh, some mysterious force unpinned it and flew it across the room. The rosary was set at the bedside in honor of Our Lady of Fatima. I took, there was a bookcase in the house at Mount Rainier, I was told, weighing about 50 pounds that moved itself precisely placed. 50 pounds just moving by itself. The most distinct markings on Robbie's body, picture of the devil on, the, uh, on Robbie's right leg and the word hell imprinted on Robbie's chest in such a way that Robbie could read the letters plainly. When the prayer to St. Michael was recited, it really stirred up Robbie with extreme restlessness and bodily movement. Two people had to hold Robbie down, and vulgar language came out of his mouth, which was very unlike him. His mother said, that is not our Robbie. Robbie's fighting was so exhaustive that when he woke up, he always asked for a glass of water, and he claimed of the intense heat from which he had suffered in his combats. Robbie also had singing he never sang too much before. Singing, he would sing Old Man River. And he would sing Swanee. <laughs> During the prayer of exorcism, Robbie would spit directly into the face of those saying the prayers, the brothers and the Jesuit priests. He had a direct, boy, could he spit it like from here to here, right in your face. It seemed that the devil, the weird force, would leave and then return. Vulgarity was common, even though Robbie never used vulgarity. 
Get away from me, you assholes. Excuse me. Go to hell, you son of bitches. That was not Robbie that his parents knew at all. So something was happening here. I'm sorry for, you know, I'll just blank that out, redact it, okay? <laughs> Upon Robbie's return to Alexian Brothers on the 10th of April, Brother Emmett, who he loved Brother Emmett, kept him busy with manual work. He would take him out in the garden. It was April. He would take him out in the garden, and I tell you, Robbie said, Brother Emmett, I love you so much. You're so nice to me. And the parents said the same thing. That Brother Emmett, Brother Emmett died uh, oh, about uh, 20 years ago, but uh, he was such a good friend of Robbie. Robbie appreciated Emmett so much. During Holy Week, the brothers prayed around the clock for Robbie and for the evil spirit to leave him. Easter Monday, the 18th of April, in the afternoon, the brothers brought Robbie a plate of food. Robbie picked up the plate, ran to the window of the hospital, held the plate in a perpendicular manner, and dared the brothers to step closer. One of the brothers crawled under the bed to restrain him, but the plate was hurled against the opposite wall and broke into tiny bits. Father Bodern, O'Flaherty, and Bishop arrived at 7 p.m. to begin the prayer of exorcism. Father Bodern put a crucifix in Robbie's hand, but Robbie threw the crucifix across the room. From 9.30, and I'm almost finished out, to 10.30 on April the 18th, Robbie, well, this is in the evening, Robbie was in a sort, uh, was a, uh, uh, in and out of seizures. While he was out of seizures, Robbie led the rosary with the priests and brothers. His reverence seemed remarkable. He wasn't even Catholic, but he learned to say the rosary. The brothers taught him to say the rosary. Robbie was more cooperative than ever before. He stated several times that he saw light, which seemed to be at the end of a dark tunnel. Father Bishop would say the exorcism prayer to St. Michael again and again. At 10.45 p.m., the most striking event of the evening occurred. This is on Easter Monday, 1949. The following came out of Robbie. A voice came out of Robbie. Satan, Satan, I am St. Michael, and I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave this body in the name of Dominus, which is Latin for God, immediately, now, now, now. And then came the most violent contortions of the entire period of exorcism since March 16th, when he was at a relative's house. After 12 midnight, Robbie led the rosary and the parent and the brothers responded. The next day, the mass was April 19th, the day after the, this was completed. The mass was said in the chapel of the hospital in Thanksgiving. In a few days, the parents took Robbie back to Mount Rainer, and he was fine. Bobby, Robbie kept in touch with the brothers for many years. As I said, when he got married some years later, he named his first boy Michael. And... Um, Today, Robbie would be in his probably mid to late 80s. Uh, and uh, so anyway, um, I, I already showed you the statue of St. Michael, but one more thing is what I want to show you is for the, uh, this was printed, this is, uh, it was printed by, uh, this is the uh, 20th, yeah, it was 40 years ago that some St. Louis University Jesuits shared a harrowing experience with the boy. And this is setting, this is from the uh, South City Journal, setting the exorcism record straight. Slew Jesuits shed light on the exorcism of 1949, and it, it, it was a full page article because it was the, uh, as I say, the 40th uh, anniversary yeah, of, of what happened, the strange events that happened. So anyway, that's all. Okay. <laughs> we have plenty of time for questions. I'll bring this microphone out to the audience. I might, might want to make sure that that uh, table mic works too, but let me bring this out. Anybody have a question? Am I supposed to? Are we supposed to? He's going to. Oh, okay. 
Test, test, okay, it's working. Thank you so much for sharing. Since this is the exorcism we still hear about, has it ever happened again? Were there, are there small ones that we don't know about? Was this a once in a century kind of phenomenon? I don't know how to place it. Uh, I really uh, don't know. Uh, it could happen, although I must say, and in that uh, 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 documentary, it shows that there is something, for example, there was a archbishop or somebody in somewhere in Africa that was doing all these exorcisms, and it was a bit of a hoax. It was, so we're, 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 we can see where it is, and in fact, the, the Vatican said, stop. This is a hoax because people are going crazy and all the rest of it. They were just, you know, flowing all over and everything. It wasn't truly an exorcism. So uh, there are phenomena that, that happen that we don't understand what, what it is. It could be uh, a possession, but I think it's rather rare. I don't think it uh, happens too often. And as I say, but whatever it is or not, it makes a difference when good always overcomes evil. I tell you, I walked the streets of St. Louis here on South Broadway for 30 years, and I saw some real, real problems. I saw some real, but all those 30 years, even though I was confronted with a person with a gun, I don't know who pointed at me. A, uh, a prostitute who wanted to uh, get out of prostitution and her pimp was, uh, and she screamed at me asking if I had a cell phone. I said, no, I don't have a cell phone. She said, oh my God, oh my God, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. And this, this guy, uh, Bates and around Bates and Broadway, he comes out of his car or his van and he's a real big husky guy and he says, you bitch, pointing to her, she said, oh my God, don't kill me. So I didn't know what to do. So you know what? Here's what I did. My last name is Longo. Italian, Sicilian, mob. I had a jacket. I went like this. I said, do you know what? I am Sicilian and I'm a Longo, mob. Leave her alone. And he looked at me. He got into his truck, and he went that way. <laughs> she gave me the biggest hug. She said, oh, my God, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> so anyway, I still don't carry a, a, a cell phone with me. It, it's my understanding that every, every diocese does in, the, in a Catholic church is supposed to have someone trained yes. in the right of exorcism. And there, I think there was an article in, in, our, in the local paper last week or the week before about the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the exorcist in the diocese. And there might, there might actually be more than, than one. Other questions? Is it true that the young man also spoke foreign languages during the time of, of um, his um, During possession? the time of his possession. There is some indication that, for example, he did not know Latin, uh, but he did speak some Latin off and on. And uh, so... Uh, uh, from what I gather, there, there was some indication that he did say some foreign languages. Little words here and there. Yeah. And if you, if you look in, in the case study, the diary, I mean, in, 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 father, in, father, in Mr. Allen, the second edition of Possessed, there is a copy of the, of the, uh, the text. Again, as Brother indicated, uh, many of the, the names and all that are redacted. So if, I mean, if you want to read it, it's, 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 out, it's out there. You know, in, in the second edition of his book, and you can, you can look at it online. I mean, you just have to be a little persistent in, in searching. Oh, here come Craig. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. Hi, brother. <clears throat> so uh, I, too, wondered why this case, because obviously there is exorcism that is still practiced today. And then Verhagen, I had always heard that there was some connection with Verhagen. Maybe that's a legacy, and I'm not sure if there's any truth to 
for Hagen being involved in the whole case. Bill. I, I, can un I can answer that. The, uh, the, the, the rumor is, the slumor, I guess is how we, we say it here, not rumor, we say slumor. The slumor is, is that the exorcism, that something took place either in Verhagen Hall or DeBerg Hall at the, at the university. And from everything that I've seen, that's, that's not true. He was indeed in the, in the college church rectory, which unfortunately we can't see it from here, but it's around, around the corner. And if, if he was there, if he was there, when he was there, and if he was going through one of these fits and screaming and all that, which evidently occurred, the Jesuits would have, I mean, the Jesuits at that time, the scholastics would have been living in Verhagen, the priests would have been living in DeBerg, and they undoubtedly would have, would have heard him. Like they keep pointing to this room in Verhagen Hall that nobody is allowed to. Yeah. I, I've, I've been in the room, and there are dead creatures in that room, but they're dead, they're dead birds that got in there and couldn't, and couldn't get out. I'm not trying to diminish the story. And the reason that they, don't, they didn't want anybody up there is because you would be, you'd break your neck trying to, to get to it because you had to go up a rickety, rickety ladder. But I, I mean, he was, to my knowledge, he was never in another university building other than the rectory at the church, and, and possibly the church itself. I, I just want to add something to that. I just wanted to let you all know that when, when the boy left, the room on the fifth floor was locked and closed. It was only used as a storeroom, you know. So, uh, and it was at the end of the hall and it was a storeroom. However, when our employees went into it to get some of the storage, whether it was summer, winter, spring, or fall, there was an actual, they felt all, like a chill went through them, an actual chill. It didn't matter what time of the year it was. And so uh, that, that really affected some of them saying, I don't even want to go up to that storeroom anymore. We had a question over here, excuse me. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for your presentations. I was wondering um, if there's any documentation of a uh, residue of any of the manifestations on the young man's body during the exorcism? To, to my knowledge, no. I, I've, never, I've never heard or, or seen any, you know, anything indicating that there was any, any, any you know, residue or, or something like that. Yes, ma'am. The manifestation, there was one manifestation on, I knew all of the people who did the exorcism. Um, and Father Boland was one of them. And um, on his chest, the number 63 would appear whenever he was in the room. And they didn't know whether it was 63 legions or what, or 1963. And Father Boland said he was a little worried when he turned 63, whether it was directed at him. But those are the things. Also, um, when you said during the levitation, um, when he was being held, they said, he kept said, oh, it's too tight, it's too tight. And Father Boland said he loosened his hand just a little, and with that, the young man, now Father Boland could fill this. He was a, a chaplain during World War II with the Navy, and I mean, he was built like a football player. Anyway, he said this young man lifted his hand, hit him in the forehead, split his forehead, lifted him off the floor and into the wall. So he had all this capability. Go to the back here first. Pardon me. Thank you for the wonderful history of the Alexian brothers. And there's one question I have for Brother Warren. Um, I've always wondered why the Alexian brothers chose nursing. Can you, can you talk to that for just a minute, please? Why we chose what? Nursing. Why you, you're nursing. yourself and, and oh, many oh. brothers are nurses. Yeah. Uh, we did that because during the bubonic plague, that's what we did. We did, we nursed them. We nursed the sick, the dying, we buried the dying. And uh, so that was, uh, so we didn't have a founder who said, you know, like the, the, many of the sisters had a founder who nursed the sick. because You know, it is very interesting because there isn't many orders of brothers who are in nursing. But we are. We're, but we're not necessarily all in nursing. We're all in health care. 
And might, one might be a technician, uh, uh, one might be an administrator, one might be a uh, laboratory technician, and one might be x-ray technician. We were all in that area, yeah. Uh, the last thing on my mind was to become a nurse, but then when I worked at the Sisters Hospital in Racine, where I was, and I saw what the good that they did, I said, you know, I want to be a nurse. I want to nurse people. I want to be with them when they died. Because I and uh, believe me, those are wonderful experiences to be with them, to give them comfort and to give the relatives comfort. We have a question back here. I read Possessed uh, when it came out because our uncle was. Uh, this is what I got in that book was a scribe, a young Jesuit scribe in, I guess, the room in the residence. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to that. It's the only, the, the only, uh, sorry, uh, the, the only written evidence we have of that, uh, they, in, in that book, uh, he's referred to, and then his uh, obituary is quoted. They say that he had been a, hero in the Second World War, and um, so I, I'm just interested if what we know about the other priests besides the primary exorcists and the um, brothers who cared for the boy. The uh, diary itself was written by a father bishop. Yes. There was a seminarian, which you don't use this term uh, in... Uh, the Jesuits do not use the term seminarian, but there was yeah. a seminarian. Scholastic, we would have called him a scholastic. scholastic. Yeah. Uh, and that was a, his last name was Halloran. Mm -hmm. And Halloran was there. He was there at the uh, location in Bel Nor. And then when they eventually, the boy came to the hospital, he participated in that. So by scribe, you mean somebody recording the. Yeah, well, that, that was Bishop. I think it was Father Bishop, because Haller, ha Mr. Allen talked with Halloran uh, when he wrote his book, Possessed, and and, uh, and Blatty spoke with Father ba Father Bowdern, uh, and Blatty, at least from what I understand, Blatty said that Bowdern provide or that Blatty had a copy of the case study, the diary, but I've heard other things that that's not, that, that's not true, and that's, and that's part of the issue here, and I'm, I mean, I'm, uh, with this, this story, is regardless of whether you believe he was possessed or was ill or making it up, trying to figure out what happened when and where, it's, that becomes very difficult, too. Uh, so um, I don't, if you guys had anything else you, want, you wanted to add there. Uh, I, I, I want to say that um, uh, one of the things that in the uh, DVD, in the grip of evil, I think it's Father Halloran who uh, says in there that right after 10:45 p.m. on the day, on the evening that the Saint Michael yelled out, "Gone!" You know, get out now, now, now. That they heard some shots, and I think some of the brothers said they heard like a shooting. And then they in the in the college church. This is what Father. Uh, uh, Halloran says, or you know, one of the priests says in this uh, video or DVD, that they saw a bright light came into the sanctuary of the college church. And they, they saw something in that looked like Michael the Archangel spearing the snake or the, 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 the dragon. And that's what they had seen. That's what they say, uh, which is very interesting. It's well portrayed in, in the uh, DVD. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. I hope this question makes sense. But I saw that movie when I was very young. And I've always wondered what your opinions are as priests. At, and I'm sorry if this question is ignorant. I'm not Catholic. But I've always wondered, when I saw that movie, how do I put this? So there was a movie called Devil's Advocate with Al Pacino where he played the devil come to earth and he used his position as a New York attorney to wreak all kind of havoc in the world, which that made sense to me as something the devil might do on earth. And I always wondered um, with the story, The Exorcist, 
What is your belief about what the end game would be of a demon who, in that case, possessed a little girl who was bound to her room doing nothing but swearing at people and um, it, she, it didn't seem like a, a way to effectively um, spread evil, I guess, and I just, I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm sincerely, somebody's laughing at me, but I'm sincerely curious as to what your belief would be in terms of what would the um, end game of that demon be? I don't know. <laughs> it, it, let, let, me, let me say something here. It, whenever, I guess it was 2008, we, we did a presentation on the exorcist, or the exorcism over in, in DeBerg Hall. Anyway, we had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Blatty, uh, who passed away about two years ago. In any case, he, uh, he, he I'm just going to paraphrase this, he asked us the question, what was the name, and I'll ask you, what was the name of the book that I wrote? What was the name of the book? The Exorcist. And what was the name of the movie? The Exorcist. And what does everybody talk about? Demons and devils and head spinning and spitting and all that stuff. And he said, and this is, I'm relating this pretty much, pretty accurately. He says, you're missing the point of the book and the story. Now, Blatty's saying this after he made lots of money off of this. But anyway, uh, he said, what did those guys, whether you're a, an Alexian brother or a Jesuit, what did they see when they, when, when they looked at that boy? They saw, did they see the devil? Yeah, Father Bowdern believed that. Father Haller, well, later on, Father Haller, and he goes back and forth on that. What, ba what Blatty said is they saw somebody in trouble, and what did they do? They helped him, that's right. Now, they thought the way to help him was to perform an exorcism, and evidently it, it worked. And so Blatty's point was is we all miss the point when we talk about devils and demons and all this, that, and, not, and I'm not dim diminishing that, but he said it's about one person helping another person who's in trouble and not, and not overlooking it. You might think that's, that's, that's silly, but that's what, Blatty, that's what Blatty told us a few years ago. Now, un unfortunately, he's gone now, so we can't, we can't talk to him. I would just like to say, uh, and uh, Gene Crampy over there, who is a friend of mine and worked with us at PACE, our PACE program for the elderly, uh, I did many things to help the elderly out, would it do their funerals, attend their funerals, yeah, be with them when they die. But we had one lady that her son called me up and said, Brother Warren, can you do something? Because my mother come, keeps saying that there's a ghost in the house. She sees it. And so she comes down the stairs and at night, and I'm, tr and I'm sleeping, and she's going to stumble and fall and break her, her neck, or, or, you know. And I say, he said, do you think you could come over and do an exorcism, uh, not, like with holy water and stuff? Well, I got my stuff together, and I did. I really did, because she wanted me to do it, and he wanted me to do it. I'm not a priest. I'm a, I'm a brother, just a brother. <laughs> And uh, so I went over there, and I sprinkled holy water from room to room. I said some prayers in each one, and lo and behold, this is absolutely true now. The son said, after uh, he called me the second or third day and said, and I could tell when, I was, when she was uh, at pace that she was different. She was lively and laughing. She wasn't like that before. And he said, something happened. She is happy. She's content. She's not walking down the stairs anymore. She says, the ghost is gone. So the different rituals that we have, uh, you know, are, are, can be very helpful to people, can be very helpful. If you show them love, and I showed this lady a lot of love, and she, she liked me a lot because I, I would sit and talk with her, and, and she would always smile, and she was so happy that I had helped her out because she felt that that was great. Let's have maybe two more questions and we'll, we'll be here for a while. I'm not going anywhere for a while, so uh, we'll, can I ask, ask questions? Hold on.
can any comment be made on um, any medical interventions that were used with the boy? Maybe he saw like a doctor or they were worried about grave dehydration. And so maybe an IV line was tried to get started or any comments on any type of medical treatment or intervention? I, I like to remind people this was 1949. There was no MRI. No, but they had IVs, they had doctors, they had treatments, they had tests. My understanding... There's a whole list of things they didn't have at the time. And they did, they did go through the process of evaluating the boy. I mean, he was evaluated in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, yeah, that's my understanding that g doctors at Georgetown, yeah. both medical doctors and psychiatrists, looked at him there yes. and they couldn't find anything yes. wrong with him. And so, so I don't mean to be short, give you a short mm -hmm. answer, but uh, medicine has changed mm -hmm. dramatically since then. There are a hell of a, more th a lot more things they can do today to find out what's wrong with this person. But what medicine had to offer back then certainly did not answer the questions. Uh, and I'd like to also say that the brothers were older brothers and very experienced nurses. Nurses are sometimes better than doctors, to be honest with you, because they're there day by day, hour by hour by hour. They're there. And so the, if, the, if, they're, if, any, if they thought that Robbie was dehydrated, they would know it. They would know it. And they'd make sure that he got water or make sure whatever it was that he needed. Uh, because uh, and all the details about that, the brothers would tell me. Oh yeah, we would. We knew uh, when when he needed to get out some water, or when he was getting dehydrated, or whatever it might be. Yeah, because they were with him day and night. Yeah, I, you know, and I'd like just just quickly add. You know, this was on a psychiatric floor. They knew there was going to be a hullabaloo taking place with this kid. So um, the Alexian brothers didn't relish the idea of such a such mayhem taking place there but it was uh, what would you expect off a, off a psych floor besides noise and people having difficult situations um, this this situation from all that I've read all that I've seen people I've talked to this was something very different <laughs> One more question, and like I said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll do two more questions here. You're yeah. catching me in a kind mood here. Let's say that. Where's the diary? Where is the diary? Well, there, there are copies of the diary around, copies of various versions. I don't know of anything where... Somebody says, well, this diary is not like this diary. I have not seen that. I was provided a copy by a stranger, and there is more to tell about that story. So the book, when it comes out, I will tell you, I will tell you in the book how I acquired something that was authentic, and it's very similar, right. if not nearly identical, to what this man walks around with. Uh, um, two things. First of all, the unredacted diary or case, it's called case study, is in the archives of the Alexian brothers under secure lock. And I have with me that one that I showed you, but it's the redacted one. And, but uh, I have a fairly good memory, but I do so. I do know the boy's last name because of the fact that uh, I'm the one that redacted it. <laughs> and when I die, I will give that one to our, uh, to our uh, uh, the archivist. By the way, it's very interesting that uh, our, um, um, the statue that little statue of St. Michael that, I sh that was shown to you, that's in our archives. It was in the, as you walked in our archive room, people were touching it so much that Donna Dahl, who is our archivist, she said, brother, I had to put it away because people kept touching it. Almost f six, eight, 10, 12 
touches a day. People are just coming in and just touching or looking at it, you know, and handling it. And you know, you want to keep it as uh, <laughs> without all that. So we put it in a safer place. Or someone could just even maybe take it. As a retired archivist, I don't think archivists get enough credit for what we do. So oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'll say, I, I'll say I will. I will confess to having touched the statue. So I got, a, I got away with it before it was put away. This will be our final question, and we'll be around for a while, so if people yeah. want to come up individually. Okay, thank you. Um, I do, I am interested, just a comment and a question. Um, the question about the end game, I think what part of the intrigue, at least for me, is that um, the boy, by all accounts, was a good kid um, who played with an Ouija board. Um, so it's there's a, a, some a bit of a fear of yeah could could this happen to me and and we all deal with our conscience and good versus evil so um, that's that's one thing you know other than prayer and and a relationship with God and trying to do good things um, you know it, it, that is just a comment okay it, it so um, but good does win over evil um, second. The, the second thing I wanted to say, and my question is, in regard to misconceptions, there are a lot of accounts that people have. Yeah, they're, they're dead birds in that room, and you address that a little bit. It's filled with dead birds, or that elevator skips that floor. And um, So can you address some common misconceptions of this story and um, kind of set us straight so when we go back, um, we can help eliminate these misconceptions? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and, yeah. as some of you might tell, I'm somewhat of a, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what I am on, on, this, on this story. I think one of the problems that I, and certain, don't get me wrong, I have not spent my entire life trying to research this story. Having said that, I've seen enough and read enough to, under, to, to come to the conclusion that it is very, there are so many versions of this story that's, and I'm, again, uh, no disrespect intended, but I knew somebody who knew somebody who talked to somebody who talked to somebody. And when you start going down that, that path, then who knows where you're, where you're, going, to, where you're going to end up. Uh, I mean, people swear that, uh, uh, well, for example, Father Halloran, uh, you know, some people you know, think that Father Halloran uh, was always convinced that this was, that Father Halloran was the scholastic, the seminarian, Back in 1949, he became a priest, and he was he be, later became a chaplain in the army during during Vietnam. Some people say that Father Halloran uh, believed that it was that it was a true possession, but then I talked with Mr. Allen right here in this building who interviewed Father Halloran, and Father Halloran, when he was you know old, said he saw worse things in Vietnam than he saw there. So I don't know. Uh, I, all I would do is caution you to, you know, and that's what, what Pat is doing, is, is trying to look at the actual documents, is, you know, be careful how you draw your conclusions. Make sure you, and I'm coming at this as an historian, as a, as a researcher, you know, be careful to evaluate your sources, you know, where you're, where you're getting it from. I don't know if either of you had anything yeah. to say. Well, I just want to say that every single person is unique. So we all have a unique way of looking at things. So you're never going to get a complete, this, you know, this is, this is it. Because we all have our past, our present, that, uh, that, that clouds or that, that helps to, to, for, for things. We all have a different view of things, okay? But before we go, I have a friend here, Jane Nelson, and we, could you give the microphone to her? Because I, <laughs> she worked at Pace, and uh, I just want to... Uh, see what she has to say. Thank you, Brother Warren. Yeah. What I wanted to find out, I'm glad that I worked at the hospital on the fifth floor after no, they, that's right, yeah. they tore down the old one. Um, you knew Father Bowdrin, and how was he affected after the exorcism? Did it affect him after it? Or was he back to, you know, his old self? Yeah. I can't answer that myself because I, I never met Father Bodern, but no, no, no. Uh -uh. Just, I'm familiar with every brother that assisted him, 
but not with the uh, with Father Bowder. And and I I didn't know Father Bowder. I remember Father Bowder hearing confessions in the college church when I was a student here, but he, he evidently lost between fifty and seventy five pounds during during the ordeal, uh, and there were reports that uh, and then. In the um, in the book and in the movie, they talk about where well, you're going to you know you're going to die. Father Bowden lived till he was in his mid 80s, and and I think he did go back. I mean, he I did. I think he did. I know he went back to the church as a you know as a priest. His ne I've spoken with his nephew and his niece, and they said Uncle Billy. They called him Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy believed to the day he passed that it was a true possession, and that he was dealing with the, the if not the devil himself, you know. Uh, 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 a, de a demon, uh, but he would never. They said Uncle Billy would never say say much about it, you know. And, and just as as Brother Warren and, and Pat said, the, the Alexan brothers never said anything, and, and and the Jesuits didn't either, you know. And but you know, people. Well, that's all. That's all I'll say. We're going to be here for a while. Thank you all very much for attending, and uh, please come up and ask questions. There was plenty. I should say plenty of food, but there is some food left up here. Thank you very and much. And by the way, there are. As I said, two books here you can take if you first come, first serve. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh.